Hello and welcome back to Jump To It for irishracing.com. I'm your host, Joe Ryan. And in this show, we'll be going through some of the standout performances from last weekend, as well as looking to the big races from this weekend. And of course, providing you with some more top tips and betting advice from our experts. So let's bring in the team. We've got Ed Quigley, Stephen Harris from Betting Expert and Vincent Finnegan from irishracing.com. So Vincent, we'll start with you looking back at Fairy House. Some absolutely stellar performances. I mean, we're going to touch on Honeysuckle as well but just take us through some of those key races that stood out for you yeah three grade ones also a very good grade three on the on the card the three grade runs in fairness were fantastic races for all for different reasons the first one was the um the royal bond when you had my mate mozzy looked all over a winner I'd, I'd fancy that last weekend i thought on the good ground it was a a decent bet and um, take a chance they it ended up it, it drifted out from six to four on the Thursday out to about two to one um, on the day, but was backed into five to four by the off. It was about four lengths clear, jump on the second last, looked all over, and then it kind of fell in a little bit of a hole and got caught by one of Willie Mullins as a filly called Statuaire. Um, nabbed it on the line by a short head, but it was a cracking race, great spectacle to watch. Then we had the Drinmore Novice Chase. Um, I'd fancied one in that, which was Beacon Edge. I thought it would get the better of um, the Jessica Harrington horse on the ground um, and it turned out that was the, that was the case but it was a very funny race beacon edge looked all over beaten all the way around looked like it might pull up after jumping maybe the fourth last between the fourth last and third last and then it stayed on out of the clouds to nab the other two on the line it was a, it was a, a cracking renewal now in fairness that gabby nacko of um gavin cromwell's ran a blinder and so did fury road uh, fury road was a horse that i personally um light but i just didn't think the ground had suited so it was a very good run from that and then we had the big race itself which was honeysuckle she was absolutely awesome it was fantastic to see a crowd back in fairy house as well and um, she was really brilliant i it's hard to know where she goes from here in the sense when when will she ever be beaten the answer at this stage is beginning to look like she may never be beaten um, and yeah. i i can't see anything that there's nothing to challenge her in the the two mile hurdle ranks at the moment like you, you've only got to look at the type of horses that that she's been running against and that she's been beating easily like epitante has met uh, honeysuckle twice been beaten nine and a half lengths and 12 and a quarter lengths that twice they've met so epitante is the nearest market rival at the moment at probably somewhere between 14 and 20 to one wherever you look anti post for the champion hurdle so that doesn't look a danger and then the other horse the, the other irish one is sharja and um, the Willie mullins horse four times it's met um honeysuckle the nearest it's ever got is two and a quarter lengths so no reason why that'll ever beat honeysuckle either. she looks to be improving all the time so. now vincent you also you sorry, you touched on epitante there as well let's go over to stephen and just get your view on the racing at newcastle the fighting fifth of course was pretty close uh ending up in a dead heat but which horses stood out for you which eye catchers came out of newcastle well i think the first thing to say joe is i mean newcastle is their big day of the year on the turf uh, and the weather absolutely ruined it. The mm. meeting was run in a blizzard, very strong winds, and it then started to snow really heavily halfway through the afternoon. I mean, the fields were pretty small to start with. The fighting fifth, I think, was, I mean, substandard renewal. It's a, it, they usually get a pretty disappointing turnout, but sometimes there's an exceptional winner. And Epitante had a chance to put her career back on track. She'd had a back operation in the closed season, and they thought she was pretty much back to her best. But... She travelled smoothly. Her run got messed about a bit, but I didn't particularly like her attitude when she hit the front. She seemed to be curling up off the bridle and ended up dead heating with Not So Sleepy, who's basically a top-level handicapper with a good attitude, Not So Sleepy. I mean, it's it's form that will have very little bearing on Cheltenham in March. Uh, as some of the Twitter wags were saying that Honeysuckle wouldn't have lost any sleep after mm. that performance, and I think that's true. I mean, Epitante looks the only realistic sort of English trained challenger who might get close to uh, Honeysuckle. But as Vincent's just said, um, you know, she's already safely held and Honeysuckle seems to be thriving and improving, whereas Epitanti is obviously a mare who's had plenty of problems. Uh, elsewhere on the card, uh, Joe, just a couple of horses who really caught my eye. Cooper's Cross, who I actually backed quite heavily. Uh, he managed to finish second somehow, having traded at nearly the minimum price all the way around, virtually. He looked sure to win and I suspect... His owner, who had a very big bet on him, who's quite vocal on Twitter, a very good punter, um, he'd be absolutely stunned that he got beat. He seemed to be extracted out and hit the front too soon. And I suspect he was sort of buffeted by the, 
the gale force winds that were blowing and it rather stopped him. And Adam Wedge got up his inside on one of Evan Williams' outsiders and, and beat him. So Cooper's Cross is a, a very much to keep an eye on in the coming weeks. And also, let's go over to Ed as well. Your well, performances at Newbury as well. Some standout performances. Cloudy Glenn, of course, winning the, uh, the Labbrooks trophy. Uh, so, yeah, Ed, take us through some of your standout performances from Newbury. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, Cloudy Glenn for Venetia. Uh, memories of Teton Mill getting the job done there uh, for Venetia Williams. 33 to 1. A little bit of an upset in the big one on that occasion. Of course, I was all in on Fiddler on the Roof. So, it's a little bit. Um, little bit frustrating. I was, I was actually at my sister's wedding that day, but she was um, she was late coming down the aisle, which was brilliant. So I managed to fire, fire up the race. Um, and then only to my disappointment, yeah, another, another, tw another 20 yards. And I think Fiddle on the Roof probably gets there. But it was it was a cracking run by the Collins' hard horses second, giving £10 to the winner. And of course, they pulled more or less a distance uh, clear of the third. So yeah, it was a pretty smart performance for them. Sounds like in the aftermath, uh, Fiddler on the Roof may end up in a King George now because his mark shot up to 159. So it kind of handicaps her out of the equation uh, going further forward. So, yeah, um, of others in there, I suppose it clapped the rear was the disappointment of the race. Uh, the horse reportedly lost his action on the quick ground. I think they'll lower their sights next time out. But uh, I think pretty much ground conditions are going to dictate with that Henry de Bromhead horse going further forward. Um, They'll just look for when the mud is absolutely flying. Uh, elsewhere on the same card, uh, we'll pick out Ahoy Senor. Of course, he won the John Frankham novice chase in uh, emphatic fashion. Came in by 31 lengths in the end. Uh, there is a school of thought. Perhaps he was a little bit flattered because Mr. Incredible's jumping went to pieces. And uh, I don't think the Dan Scouted horse travelled or went a yard at all. So, yeah, you could perhaps pick holes in it. But nonetheless... This is a horse of a serious engine. He's now vying for favouritism for the Festival Novices Chase at the Charter Festival. Of course, he saw off uh, Brave Man's game quite convincingly, didn't he? At entry over hurdles. And so it'd be interesting if those two did clash in March over fences. So a uh, hoist in yours is very impressive. And then if you go back to the Friday, of course, you had the big three mile hurdle, which was won by Thomas Darby, um, which was, was tipped up for this show. And uh, I was delighted with that performance. It was kind of last chance saloon with him because. Uh, they said it whether he needed the run. Well, he had his run to get him spot on for this, and it, it kind of worked. And I think he does need to brush up in the jumping department still, but I, I was very impressed with this performance because he made an absolute horlicks of the fourth last. He dropped back to last of the entire field, and then managed to just pass, go past everybody again. He was ridden to close on the leaders to Paisley Park and on the blind side. He closed them down. He then came back on the bridle and went away again. I'm actually a bit shocked, to be honest with you, looking for, uh, further forward. And he's still 25 to 1 uh, in a couple of places for the Stayers Hurdle, uh, uh, Joe. I mean, that's the kind of thing to take out of that race. Uh, we, we touched on it on a, a show uh, a couple of weeks ago that the, there's, you know, there's no honeysuckle in the Stayers Hurdle division, if, if you like, at the moment. You know, Flooring Porter, since winning the Stayers Hurdle, obviously he's been pulled up and fallen. You've had uh, Time Hill tailed off on his comeback. Paisley Park looks uh, pretty much a spent force. You know, there's no kind of one horse dominating. And uh, sounds like they're either going to go to Ascot or the Cleave Hurdle with him next. And I, yeah, I, 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 I'm still jumping to it follows could do a lot worse than uh, keep Thomas Darby on side in the uh, staying hurdle division this year well of course a great 6-1 to one winner for you last week Ed but we'll get to your tips for this week later on in the show now there has been plenty of controversy as well in this week in racing uh, lots of trials going on as well which we can't say too much about because of course they're kind of ongoing but one story that did come out was uh, trainer Mark Fahey and also Jackie uh, jockey Gavin Browder being yeah, caught for basically non-triers. So, Vincent, can you tell us a bit more about this story? What went on, and was it a fair assessment in the end? Well, it's it's interesting here. This is this relates to a handicap hurdle in Limerick on the sixteenth of November, and it's actually a race we've discussed before, which is hard to believe. It's the same race that Philip Rothwell had a horse that got suspended for the uh, for not trying in the same race. His horse was a horse called Duffy's Hody, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago. And Philip Rothwell was, was a little bit annoyed about this, and he is appealing it. The appeal will actually be held next Monday. So Duffy's Hody finished sixth and was adjudged to have not tried. The horse got 60 days. Philip Rothwell was fined €2,000, and the jockey Adam Short got 10 days. In the same race, the horse that finished ninth, which is called Strong Boots, was given 90 days. So it was given 30 days more than Duffy's Hody as a suspension. The jockey Gavin Broder, he got 21 days, which is more than double the suspension that Adam Short got. And Mark Fahey was fined €6,000, the trainer, which is three times what Philip 
Rothwell was was fined. Now the difference here is, and this is why it's it's a little bit unusual. This one is Duffy's Hody would would fall into the category of the standard type of horse that the stewards seem to pull in as non triers in Ireland, a complete outsider, a twenty eight to one chance, and mm. um, nobody backed it. it, made no difference to no one, and they bring it in, they suspend it for saying it didn't try. The difference with the Mark Fahey horse called Strong Roots is it went off favourite. It was well backed in the day, back from seven to one into just over two to one, 85 to 40 favoured. It went off on the day. Now, why? I don't know, because it's a nine year old mare, had never won in eight races. And again, in this particular race, she was unsighted. She ended up finishing 10 and a half lengths behind Duffy's Hody mm-hmm. back in ninth, was always out the back. So what happened on the day was the stewards held the inquiry into Philip Rothwell. They tried to hold an inquiry into this Mark Fahey horse, but unfortunately, um, Garode Bruder or sorry, Gavin Bruder, he's one of three brothers from Kerry, mm. the others are Kevin and Garode. So anyway, Gavin is the, this guy, he's a seven pound claimer. Um, he, he, got, he got a fall in the following race for a Mark Fahey horse again, which was looking like it might have won. It was disputing the lead when it fell at the last, so they couldn't interview him after the fall, so they had to refer this matter on. So as I say, it's very interesting that they gave the horse the, um, the suspension and to, to the trainer and jockey as well. It's, it's at the higher end of their scale, basically. And I presume that is the fact that the horse went off favourite. Why it went off favourite, I'm still struggling to work out on form. But at the same time, it's an interesting one and no sign of an appeal either as of yet. I mean, well, Browder in the case actually came out and said that he didn't feel that the horse was right. That's, that's what I'm right in thinking that, okay? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so yeah, it's hard it one to judge, I guess. Yeah, it is. And like he was saying, he was talking about asking other jockeys in the early stages of the race, you know, what do you think of my horse? Is it travelling okay? It doesn't feel right under me. Look, it's it's hard to know. You can you can take it with a pinch of salt, some of the stuff that's said at these inquiries, because people are trying to get themselves off the hook, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way, Mark Fahey is saying now that he wasn't happy with the ride, but yet he never told the jockey on the day. He also didn't report that to the stewards on the day. He was saying the reason he didn't say it to the jockey is because he had a runner in the next race and he had to run and saddle that. And uh, similarly, he thought that the inquiry might have been held and he would have he would have spoken up at that about his dissatisfaction with the ride and everything else. But as I say, we are where we are. With it. It's just very interesting for a favourite to be deemed a non-trier. It's a very unusual thing in Ireland, sir. Well, yeah, of course, um, like I said before, there are ongoing trials as well going on between jockeys and uh, allegations of plenty as well. For all the latest updates, head on over to irisracing.com. But for Jump To It, we're going to try and get you some winners. So let's go into the big upcoming races and try, like I say, to get some winners out of these races. So we're going to start off with a race uh, on Friday at Sandown, the 225, the Ballymore Winter Novices. Ed, Brave Kingdom looks like the, uh, the pretty standard favourite for this one, but let's take us through the card and what do you make of the race? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was covering that che- uh, Chepstow meeting elsewhere uh, where Brave Kingdom won uh, last time out. Oh, crikey. Uh, I mean, look, it was a maiden hurdle at Chepstow, but away he went about his business. Uh, his first start for, for Paul Nichols and a horse... By and large, jump beautifully. Just let's have a huge engine on him. I mean, straight away after that, I thought something like the Chalo Hurdle uh, would be the target for him. Sounds like they're getting, obviously they're running here, and uh, his stable mate who won uh, won at Newbury, uh, Stage Star, is going to go to the Chalo Hurdle. But yeah, I, I was thinking about tipping him later on in the show uh, when he, I think he was around five to two earlier in the week. But obviously the race has cut up now. He's, he's around even money, which is is probably fair enough. Uh, I don't want to get involved at those prices, but. Uh, He's definitely the, the exciting horse in here. I wouldn't want to look past him. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to lay even, it's funny enough, because mm-hmm. I just think, yeah, he, he won 10 lakes hard held. Uh, he's had his wind up. Uh, he said he was a really fluid jumper. Uh, he was pretty soft at Chepstow that day. Um, we were talking about this off-air game, so we always talk about it each week. Uh, you know, the ground, it's been the driest November on record um, at Sandown, uh, mm-hmm. but there is some rain forecast uh, throughout Friday which I think will just play into his strength. So, yeah, he, he's definitely the one. I, I think he's a rock-solid favourite. Obviously, uh, the Kim Bailey horse has to be respected and clearly has stamina in the locker because he won just over shy of three miles last time out. But he looks a typical Kim Bailey three-mile galloper, if you like, whereas uh, this horse looks uh, really excited type of a bit of boots. So, yeah, Brave Kingdom, I think, will take all the beating in the, uh, the 225, the Winston Novices. Great stuff. Well, let's move on to the... Uh, on Saturday as well, we're going to look at... Uh, the Henry VIII Novices Chase. So, Stephen, let's take us through this card. We've got third time lucky, won well last time out, of course. Edward Stone listed in the entry. So, let's take us through it. What kind of angle are you looking at into this race? 
Well, it's seven runners, Joe. That's never good news for punters. Just to touch Ed mm. uh, making a good point about the weather. At the moment at Sandown, I live just around the corner. It's good ground. It's not rained for about three months, it feels like. And um, <laughs> the ground's dried right out. Andrew Cooper's desperate for rain. He, I think he had the wettest ever October or start of October, but it hasn't rained at all for four weeks virtually. Um, so he's desperate for the rain. I think there's about 10 or 12 mi millimetres forecast by the time we get round to Saturday afternoon. So that whether that becomes good to soft, soft, or it misses the track, it's very, very difficult a couple of days before to be, have firm opinions. And the, the two principles in this race are quite ground-dependent horses. In my opinion, the short price favourite third-time lucky horse I really like of Dan Skelton's is a free-going hard puller who is all speed. Um, he's been sent on and he's obliterated his rivals tanking round twice this season already. Um, I'm not sure he's a sand down horse. He definitely won't be on heavy ground if it, if it really does rain. I don't think we're going to get that. I think it's going to be good to soft. At the prices, I prefer Edward Stone, who is about the same hurdler um, as third time lucky. It's taken a while to get the hang of jumping, but he was really impressive at Warwick the other day. He settled properly and he sprinted clear. And I thought his jumping which hasn't always been brilliant, was really slick. Um, and I think at the prices, one of them's around four to one. Third time lucky is about six to four. I think you've got to back Edward Stone. And how about for you, Ed? Do you see a different route into the race or do you agree with Stephen? Interesting one. I thought Stephen had been all in on the uh, the third time lucky uh, scout and wagon there. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating one. Um, too tricky for me to call. Uh, the probably the underrated horse in here would be the, uh, the Colin Tizard horse Warlord, I think who um, he looks all stamina again. He's one who probably, I think he'll two and a half over fences sooner rather than later. And he would love the rain to arrive. And of course, him and Manella drama, <coughs> excuse me, were separated by a short head at Carlisle last time out. Uh, that horse is uh, reappearing again here. I think this is tricky. This is trappy. Uh, there's a big unknown over the ground. Uh, all in all, it's one I'm happy just to sit and watch. A really exciting spectacle, but I think it's a bit too close to call personally. All right, well, let's move on to another race that might be a little bit too close to call. It might be actually the most decisive or divisive of the races we're going to talk about. The Tingle Creek at Sandown 5, currently declared. Noob Negra against Chuck and Poussoir. Ed, take us through the card. What do you make of those that are in the race and how do you see it going? Well, it's a, it's a cracking five-runner race, isn't it? I said I've never got a problem with small fields when they're chock full of quality. Uh, mm. We've got quality in abundance here, haven't we? Yeah, Captain Guinness, Shaka Poussoir, Granity, Hitman, Nube, Negra. Again, another one, <coughs> excuse me, I find it pretty tricky to call. You look back on the champion chase running, there's not, a, I mean, you can throw a blanket over Shaka Poussoir, Granity and Nube, Negra, can't you? So I think there's very fine margins here. Uh, I mean, I'm tentatively uh, maybe towards Nube Negra just because he's got the run and he, he, he's race fit. Mm. Uh, um, but then again, I, Paul Nichols is a habit of, you know, pulling jokers, you know, out of the pack here, doesn't he? And Granatini he made very clear before the Holden Gold Cup was basically going there about 30% fit, um, if you see what mm. I'm saying. I think he'll step forward a lot. And uh, Harry Cobden. Is on Hitman as well, um, of course. And again, I think he'll come on a bundle for his run in the Holding Gold Cup, where it was very much that race was used as a stepping stone for this. Uh, I think this is a head scratcher. I wouldn't, to be honest with you, it wouldn't be shocked if uh, any of them won it. Uh, I, I'd, I'll leave the dance floor to uh, my esteemed colleagues here who have very strong opinions. Um, I'm splinters in my backside here. If you were forcing me, I'd actually would back Hitman at the prices. Cobden's on, and again, I think he'll strip fitter and improve about ten to twelve pounds for last time out, but uh, with no great conviction, I must add. Well, Vincent, let's go over to you then. You're on the Chuck and Poussoir train. Uh, give us a reason why. <laughs> Because it's a one horse race. That's the, that's the main reason. Um, th th this horse is completely, utterly, totally different class. When he's on song, he'd one bad run last year in Cheltenham, and this brings the others into it in theory, but in, in reality, they've absolutely no chance against Shaq and Forswa. I cannot believe the price. This this is one where you sell the house, the car, the wife, the kids, everything. <laughs> Six to four wow. is an unbelievable price. He's, he's different gravy. Look, what we're looking at here is it's it's like Chelsea playing Norwich. They're both Premier League teams, and you're thinking, oh, these horses, they've got good form, and they've got this, that, and the other. But what you're looking at realistically is it was the Chelsea under-18 team didn't do well against Norwich at some stage last year, and people are pinning their hopes on that. Nuba Negra and Granatin, they've no chance against this horse. He's different class. You only have to look at what happened in Punchestown. He's backed into 6-5 to five to beat Alaho, who's a serious horse as well. 
and you have Nupa Negra. Nupa Negra, how far back was he that day? 24 and a half lengths behind Shakam Porswa. So a proper Shakam Porswa, all guns blazing, will be 24 and a half lengths in front of Nupa Negra, in my opinion. You've also got the fact that the track shouldn't be an issue, the trip isn't an issue, the ground isn't the issue, and he runs really well fresh. I, I can't see him beat, in fairness. Right, Vincent, you say it up nicely then for Stephen, who's <laughs> like on the this. Noob Negra side. Give us a reason why, oh. Stephen. Why are you going for Noob Negra? Well, I, I, all, I massive respect for the Irish. Well, my, my starting point into any race is that Ireland have got a stone in hand over their English rivals. So I'm certainly not normally natively sort of favouring England over Ireland in any way. I tend to side with them full stop, certainly at festivals. The one thing I'll say about Shakin Pursuit is only ever... Uh, obviously, he came from France. He's run in Ireland on every single occasion, bar one. And that one was when he came to Cheltenham last year. He had the perfect sit all the way around the track. He had to win 10 lengths jump in the last. And he stopped on the running. I mean, I've no idea why or what happened. I think they were absolutely mortified. I think he ended up getting sent off about 13 or 8 on. And he got beat. They'll never know. That's the only time he's ever raced outside of Ireland. Um, he's flown round. He was very impressive back in April, back at Punchestown, back on home soil. Um, Sandown, I think this is a ground-dependent race as well. If it gets soft, that's very much in Vincent's Knapp's favour. If it stays closer to good, I think Noob Negra might do him for speed. And I think the key with this race is that Captain Guinness is actually going to run. Now, Captain Guinness doesn't always front run, but at Cheltenham last year, he went absolutely bananas in, on the lead in the race won by shishkin in so much style captain guinness could go off hard here it'll help noob negra settle and i could see noob ne negra sweeping past on the bridle and, and i do agree with ed ed's point about fitness and um, willie mullins won't have left him short but he hasn't had a run for seven and a half months um, i'm sure he'll be 100 percent right for this but noob negra is the now horse who's improving he's young he's a glider he's run a streamer at sandown before on this card last year so he's got the experience I think he'll take quite a lot of beating. Again, it's prices, uh, Joe, isn't it? One of them is going to be 11 to 10, and the other one's 5 to 2. I'm going to back the 5 to 2 chance. I, I do disagree with Ed quickly. Greenatine has got absolutely no chance. He got beaten 300 yards at Exeter. <laughs> he, he looked a completely gone horse. He might not have been fit. I can't Wasn't have fit. that. Wasn't Nichols is, but Nichols <laughs> doesn't run these horses in top races half. I mean, I'm sure he might come on for the run. he would come on for the run and get beaten 25 legs. I don't fancy Hitman at all either. And I thought he was really disappointing not to win. He had he had the Halden Gold Cup, stone cold two out, and I wasn't impressed with his finishing effort at all. I, I don't think he'll get up the hill either. So I think it's probably a match, and I think that Noob Negra might just be able to beat Chacon Poussoir at this stage of the season. Well, of course, we'll come back next week to review how the Tingle Creek goes. <laughs> it should be a fascinating encounter. Well put forward, guys, your arguments we're quite convincing. I think I'm going to favour Vincent. But anyway, we'll see what happens. Now we're going to move on to the next race up at Chesto, the Welsh Grand National Trial. Now, Ed, I want you to take us through this one. Massive field, of course, for a Grand National Trial and a weird time as well, 1.57. Uh, so set your watches for that one. But yeah, Ed, take us through it. How do you see this race shaping up? Uh, yeah, very good question, actually. Um, <clears throat> Joe, I find this a bit of a minefield, uh, in mm. truth. Um, it's, it's a race I'm staying clear of. Obviously, Truckers Lodge... Uh, it's got some good form at this venue. Uh, enjoys it, enjoys the ground. I just wonder off a mark of 150 whether the Paul Nichols horses, uh, he's just a few pounds. He's a bit exposed, shall we say, off that type of mark. And the cynical side of me uh, says I, I don't think they wouldn't mind if he, he jumped round and uh, at least got a run under his belt and came down a few pounds with uh, the, the big one in mind, if that makes sense. So I'm not going to waffle on. I think it's just far too trappy to call. Um, yeah, it, it's a tricky race. It's And also, it's worth pointing out as well, again, should we talk about it, normally, eight out of ten times, if you look back through the history of this race, this ground is running in an Amazonian swamp. Uh, yeah. I believe it's it's good good to soft in places on the chase course there. We've almost unheard of uh, in December at Chepstow. So again, that throws a totally different complexion on this race. Another absolute minefield, Joe. Uh, one I'm very happy to sit out. And for you, Stephen, just any kind of angles or thoughts on how to approach this one, given the massive field and, like Ed said, the ground being so unseasonable? Yeah, I mean, uh, Ed's bowled me a googly here because I, I thought I was going to be stealing his thunder by tipping the same horse. I, I quite fancy Faustinovok here, which mm. is the Ed Quigley system. <laughs> Colin Tizard horse. He was an expensive disappointment all of last season. He's got more seconds than Oliver Twist on his form card. <laughs> 
But I think that was at a time, as we've touched a million times before, when all the Tizards were wrong. And Faust Inovot, who's still to win under rules, I think he's run 11 times now in his career without winning. Um, he, he ran in one point to point as well. But he's a very frustrating horse, but he's extremely well handicapped. And I just wonder, first time out after 257 days off, Harry Kimber booked a valuable Saturday race. You'd imagine he'd be 100% fit. Um, I thought he might be the most interesting runner at a double figure price. Now, let's move on to another interesting race over to Aintree, the 205, the Many Clouds chase. Now, we know that Champ is going to be out, uh, but Vincent, let's take us, well, you take us through this one, Protectorat, worthy favourite for you? Possibly so. Yeah, Native River won the race uh, two years ago, was third in the race last year. The interesting thing from, from an Irish angle is Tiger Roll running here. Uh, just be interested to see the horse run. He's probably absolutely no chance. It's, this is not the long-term target, as we know. I don't know what that will be at this stage. It will probably end up being the cross-country race in Cheltenham. I'd imagine it's hard to see him go for another Grand National, but perhaps he will. Uh, an interesting race, Native River, I suppose, is is realistically... Um, he's he's the sort of horse that sets the benchmark, but I, I think he's gone. I, I couldn't see him win. Um, Album Photo was a potential runner here, so the... the and Champ as well, but neither of them go. Album Photo, I think, goes to Punchestown Sunday, um, which looks like being race of, race of the weekend, realistically. So in here, I, I would I'd be opposing Native River. That would be my only real um, angle into it, to be honest. And for you, Stephen, with the, yeah, without Champ and without Album Photo, I mean, how does the many cars line up for you? Which angle are you taking? Well, I thought Protector at I was five to one earlier in the week. You knew he was going to rut. Um, Bridget is booked to ride him, which is no negative. She's riding really well. He's race fit. He ran an absolute screamer in a red hot Cheltenham handicap. He's 100% fit. He's low mileage over fences. There's a few horses in here all looking absolute million. I mean, Tiger Roll won't be winning this race first time out. I should think he'll be tailed off. The bottom one, wishing and hoping, is impossible to fancy. The two amigos will need the run after eight months off. Simply the bets has not been working well at home since he joined Paul Nichols and was tailed off on his seasonal reappearance ran badly. Imperial Aura comes from a yard, Kim Bailey, who I really like, but they've yet to really catch fire this winter. They've not been having many runners and not been having many winners either. Imperial Aura was going OK when he fell the other day at the 13th. Um, at Haydock, but he's still got a bit to prove. His last run last season was disappointing. So I think it's between Native River, the Tizard Rule, terrific horse. I mean, he's a lovely scrapper. He'll probably get a positive ride, which is a big help around here. He jumps well. He keeps pulling out more. Maybe he wasn't right all last season. We'd all written him off. We thought he was getting old like the rest of us. He's now 11, so he's certainly not getting any younger, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was the one to put it out to protect her. But if you've got five to one protector earlier in the week, each way, what a fantastic bet that is with half the field looking absolutely impossible to fancy. Well, let's move on to another race that, again, it might be pretty tricky to pick a winner out of, but the 240 at Aintree, the Beecher handicap chase, of course. Now, over the Grand National Fences, Vincent, how do you like the spectacle of Aintree to begin with? And uh, is there any kind of angles for you going into this race? Well, certainly I love entry. Fantastic. The Grand National in particular, any of these races over the Grand National fences are fantastic. Um, the only angle I'll give you here is we've got uh, three Irish horses due to run. One of them is uh, Snow Falcon. Absolutely no chance, will not stay. Doesn't stay three miles on a park course. Very hard to see it stay here. Um, I, I, I don't know why no Mead is running the horse. Perhaps it's because he's the other horse in it as well. 2A per me. Um, maybe just bringing the two over in the box. 2A per me. This has a chance now, and um, you wouldn't rule this out. It's a, it's a while since it has won a race. hasn't won since January 2019. was originally with Mouse Morris and switched then to Noel Meadows Giggins Town horse. Had a good run recently. It was fifth in the Troy Town Chase, which is a decent handicap chase in Ireland at Navin a couple of weeks ago. Beaten 16 lengths by Run Wild Fred. That one Wild Fred won by four or five lengths. Won very easy. Not a bad run this. There was a lot of decent horses in behind, so I wouldn't rule that out. And then you have Chris's Dream. Um, Chris's dream, basically, this is a prep somewhere down the line for the Grand National. Uh, horse hasn't won since February 20. Um, so we're talking well, a year and a half, nearly two years. But was running well in the Grand National um, back in April. Was in fifth place when it unseated rider four out, blundered and unseated in uh, Stable Companion, went on to win it at Manila Times. Wouldn't rule Chris's dream out, but again, that 2A per me is probably the more likely of the, of the Irish ones to 
to be prominent here, whereas Chris's dream is probably looking more long term, and I really don't fancy Snow Falcon. And how about for you, Stephen? Any kind of tactics in terms of punting on this race, or is it just one to maybe just keep an eye on, looking ahead to the future? Well, there's 22 runners, Joe. So as we say every week on Jump to It, play each way, find a bookmaker, and offer you six or seven or eight plays. They're dying to take money on these sort of races. It looks all of eight to one the field. It'd probably be double figures the field if you look <clears> around on Saturday morning. Uh, the two I liked on my shortlist, Kimberlite, Candy, Tom Lacey's going particularly well. Uh, he's got a small team of horses, but they're all winning or running well at the moment. This one is a course specialist, got really good entry form, ran a blinder in this race a couple of years ago. Comes here fresh after seven months off uh, since disappointing in the Grand National, actually, but got a good record fresh, should go really well. Jonathan Burke, I think he's had seven winners in the last 14 days. He's absolutely flying, Jonathan Burke. That should go well. And the other one is Akil, who's another horse first time out, been trained for the race by Venetia. Soft ground ideal, good record fresh. Her horse is also, after being missing for about eight months as usual, are absolutely flying again now. They're warming up. And I should think Akil's been laid out for the race. So they'd be my two small stakes each way with a bookmaker paying six places or more. Great stuff. And for you, Ed, is this one that you'll be playing in or is it, again, just one to look ahead, maybe put some horses down in the notebook? Uh, both, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to get a few lawyers after me for um, a few libel things here, but there's essentially, there's the, as Vincent does make a good point, there's the long game of a few of these horses. Um, the greatest love in the world, the last thing they want to do is go and win this race by 15 lengths, get hiked to uh, what will in, in time be an, an impossible handicap when the uh, the entry weights come out in February and everyone's sitting there drinking their brandy and uh, all, all moaning about the fact they've been given a, an impossible rating. So uh, there's one horse further down the weights here, Le Bruy of Ben Paulings, who's rated 132. He was actually sent off joint favourite for this race 12 months ago. He's well beaten in third. However, that came off a mark of 141. So he's got in £9 mm. lower this time round. Now, to come back to my original point, off 132, he needs to be winning in order to get it himself up to a rating near enough where uh, when it comes to the the, the, the handicap weights uh, lunch in February, he can enter the conversation because he just wouldn't get in off where he is at the moment, if that makes sense. So whereas a few of these, how should we say, if they jump mm. round fit and well, finish seventh or eighth and get a few pounds off their back, I don't think connections are going to be uh, crying into their Beaujolais. So, yeah, I think Le Bruy off 1-3-2, ground to be fine. He's waited to go well on last year's win. And, uh, yeah, I, it, also another key point with him is he does look an absolute natural over the fences. Uh, for whatever you want to say about weights and measures and engines, he's jumped them beautifully. Jamie Codd came over to ride him a couple of years ago uh, and he jumped beautifully uh, it, o over these fences. Of course, we know he's got stamina. He won the National Hunt Chase at the Channel Festival a couple of seasons ago. So he's definitely one I think will be tuned up for this. Um, uh, really good young northern jockey, Danny McMenamin, takes the ride, uh, I believe, because he could do the 10 stone it is another key factor why he's been booked onto this. So, yeah, Le Bruy, I wouldn't be shocked if he put in a bold performance there uh, from to, uh, off bottom weight. Lovely stuff, Ed. All right, well, let's move on to Huntingdon and Sunday, the Peterborough Chase. Stephen, you're going to take us through this one. Again, it looks like all mankind, Dan Skelton's charge looks like, uh, yeah, worthy favourite, right? Um, well, he's definitely favourite. I mean, again, it's difficult at the moment, Joe, to talk about this. We don't know what's going to run. Um, there's quite a few of them won't run. I doubt um, we'll see uh, probably horses down the bottom there won't run. I'd be surprised if Notebook came over. But um, good to soft at the moment at Huntingdon, a sharp right-handed track. There's loads of pace on here if they all turn up. Cool Cody. All Mankind wants the front run. Um, there's a couple of a first flows of front runner. Master Tommy Tucker is an absolute front runner. So I'm sort of looking at it now thinking, well, if these all turn up, there's a chance All Mankind might get ruined on the lead. Uh, and, of course, I've always got it in my head with All Mankind. I remember before Dan ran him, uh, his first run over hurdles, he went from something like four to seven out to five to two. He was virtually unrideable at home. They couldn't get a saddle on him. He bolted on the gallops every time. And he, he started to bolt to post at Warwick that day. Now, he's a totally different proposition now. Since he went over fences, he's settled down. He jumps well. He's a slick jumper. But he might just get ruined on the lead here with Tommy Tucker, first flow, and one or two others. Cool code is definitely going to front run if that one turns up. So, to cut a long story short, Joe, um, I quite like an old thief, an old veteran, Bun Doran from a yard I normally avoid like the plague, Tom George. He has about 10 winners a year, not for me under any circumstance. But but 
the flip side is he had three winners in the last fortnight. And it's also actually running well now to get grounds dried up, which is quite normal. That tends to be when he has winners. Um, and Bundoran is one of those horses who looms into the picture on the bridle going away. You think, oh, who's that? You know, that thinking he's going to win. And he never quite delivers what looks likely. But in this instance, he might be a very, very big price. He'll get a patient ride. And there's just a chance things might fall in his lap. So I'll keep him on side if, if the, all the front runners turn up. Great stuff. All right, well, let's move on to the final race we're going to look at, the one in feature, John Durkin Memorial Chase. Vincent, you can take us through this one, of course, at Punjastown. Lots of big names in this one. Are you, how much are you looking forward to it? It should be a cracker, Joe. Just firstly, I'll just say we've got some other good racing this weekend in Ireland. Navin on Saturday, we've declared runners at the moment. Um, there is a good race with that Ginto against Eric. Blood Axe is one. We've a very good uh, stay in handicap hurdle. Horses like Duffel Coat, the Jam Man, Damalisk, the Big Dog. Um, we've also got a novice chase. It's cut up a bit, um, appreciated, and Fernie Hollow don't run. But what we do have in it is River Detail and Drill Deal. So that's interesting. And we've also got a beginner's chase there in Navan that that Ashdale Bob runs in. Um, Ashdale Bob, just it, it gives a bit of a pointer to Bob Ollinger. Ashdale Bob was running in Goran Park, was upsides. Bob Ollinger, admittedly under pressure, probably wouldn't have beat him or been near him in the finish, but uh, unseated at the third last that day. So it'd be interesting to see how Ashdale Bob gets on. Then Cork Sunday, just to mention that there's a maiden hurdle. We're still only at entry stage here, but you'd like to kill Crute and Sir Gerhardt in it. So that's well worth looking at. Uh, we've concertista in a novice chase, and then I'm told in the hilly way chase, Ergamina Willie Mullins has run. So, yeah, uh, Cork Sunday also good good action. But the big race of the weekend in Ireland, without a doubt, is the John Durkin Memorial Chase in Punchestown. This this is a race that's been won by serious horses all the way through the years. So I think we've a whole load of Gold Cup winners have come out of this. Uh, it's a two and a half mile chase. Min has won it the last three years, and this year it looks like being one of the best renewals we've had for many a year. We've got Envoy Allen is the current favourite. Alaho is due to run, and it looks like Album Photo will run as well. And I'm sure there'll be a few more in it, but like you're dealing with some high-class entries here, the likes of your Sam Crow, Manella Times is there, Tornado Flyer. Um, we've Ken Boy. Oh, it's, just, it's, it's just a who's who of Irish racing at the moment. Fakir Dudares as well. Um, so realistically, what it boils down to is it's Envoy Allen to see is he really up to this sort of level of class? I presume he is. Gordon Elliott still says best horse he's ever seen, trained, touched. Um, obviously, still very upset he doesn't train him anymore. De Bromhead is now looking like the fact that he's saying, well, like this, this is a serious animal, and he proved it the last day in Down Royal. So we're going to really see how good is he here. I was intending to say, look, he's worth a bet to take taking on these horses. But when you look at the prices, I'm now saying no. Um, he's too short. He's going to be a shade of odds on here to beat seasoned horses who've already proven it at the very, very top level. So for me, they're going four to one Alaho. Alaho looks like the bet to me if I had to have a bet in it. And how about for you, Ed? How do you like the, the shape up of the race? And do you see any kind of anyone beating Envoy Allen? Or what, what kind of angle are you taking? Oh, I just hope a lot of these make the gig because this is uh, this is just mega stuff, isn't it, really? If you if you don't like uh, this, then go and watch NASCAR or take up Croquet or something. I mean, yeah, this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Evo Allen, I, I agree with Vincent to a large extent, is he's still very much priced up on the, uh, the hype of his hurdling campaign from a couple of seasons ago. If you actually break down his chase form, you know, he won three novice chases at 1 to 33 or whatever, and then... You know, the wheels came off a little bit. It was great to see him back uh, last time out, but I don't think we learned a lot more other than that he's still got four legs. This is the kind of acid test for him uh, in against some of these horses. That The one I'm interested in, I see Fakir Duderi is going to run, who was incredibly impressive when winning the Clonmire Oil Chase recently. And, of course, he'll have race, race fit. He's race fit and he should be bang there. It's... um. It's a fascinating contest. Yeah, until we see the final makeup, I don't know. But um, I, I see Vincent's angle in terms of he's skinny enough for Envoy Allen, what he's actually achieved over fences. Uh, he's taking on a lot of 165 plus rated horses here. It will be, um, you know, they won't be short of fitness, shall we say. So, look, wonderful contest. One I'm really going to enjoy. And uh, yeah, the Irish racing as a whole over the weekend is absolute blockbuster stuff, isn't it? To have an ergamine uh, running on Sunday, we could even end up seeing the likes of Kill Crew and appreciate it as well on Sunday. I mean, it's uh, thick and fast and it really is brilliant action. Beautiful stuff. Well, of course, we will review all of these races next week as well. Any eye catches that stand out. But now we're going to move on to our tips. So hopefully get you some winning bets. <laughs> 
And Stephen, I'll start with you being the overall leader in our tips contest here on Jump To It, but not a fantastic week last week. Just take us through the results and what went wrong. Well, Killer Clown was very well backed, but stopped alarmingly quickly having travelled well. I'm not sure. Maybe the ground was a bit too testing in the end uh, for him. He was disappointed. Cooper's Cross, um, who I did have a very big bet on, who, who was, I think, sent off seven to four in the end. He collapsed in price. Um, he's owned by a very big punter. Well, my excuse, and I think it's the right one, was he was extracted and hit the front too soon. It was blowing a force 10 gale there. So I would forgive him. We'll, we'll stick with him. I've got three bets um, on Saturday Joe, um, two of them we've talked about already. Edwardston at Sandown in the Henry VIII. Um, you know, goodish, good to soft ground, absolutely ideal. I think he's better value and perhaps a more straightforward ride than third time lucky. I, I suspect with third time lucky that Harry's going to be much more patient and you might find that he pulls very hard under restraint. So maybe Edward Stone, who I think is the same horse as third time lucky over hurdles, uh, might be able to get the job done up the hill. In the big race, I'm going to take Vincent on and stick with Noob Negra mm -hmm. for Harry and Dan. Again, I'd like the rain to mainly miss Sandown. Good to soft to be fine. Noob Negra's a glider, not a grinder. Loads of speed. If it stays good, good to soft. I think he'll be hard to beat. He's 100% fit. And then a flyer over at Aintree in the 315. A horse I really like, Elvis Mail, who's trained by a very good trainer in Scotland called Nick Alexander. He's got some lovely young horses. He's very good on social media, a bit like Dan Skelton in, in the South, in fact. Uh, Elvis Mal is a hard puller. He's got loads of ability, a huge engine, and he ran an absolute screamer over fences on his seasonal debut. He made a couple of bad mistakes in a hot race at Carlisle, and he was still there too, out pressing, which was amazing. Then got tired. They're going back over hurdles at Aintree. Uh, I think he'll run a very, very big race. He's a big price, 14, 16 to 1. Lovely stuff. And now, speaking of a winner last week, and we've already touched on as well, Ed, you had Thomas Darby. So let's take us through your tips from last week and then looking ahead to this week. Yeah, indeed. It was a profitable week, uh, Joe. It felt like one that got away a little bit, though, in truth. Mm. Uh, yeah, Thomas Darby was a nice winner. I mean, Fiddler on the roof, another 20 yards. He probably wins the Labrick's Trophy. And Pick Dorhey uh, was absolutely tanking, traveling beautifully. He was about four lengths clear, wasn't he? Uh, wasn't he? As they came to four out in that novice chase. I think he, he, he traded around even money in running uh, at the time um, Harry Compton fell off. So, yeah, a little bit frustrating. Nonetheless, yeah, Thomas Darby uh, saved my bacon, shall we say. <laughs> and let's move on to your tips for this weekend. Yeah, indeed. Well, we got three here. Um, we touched upon the, <coughs> excuse me, the many clouds chase earlier. Uh, I agree with Stephen on the point that Half of the field in, in the uh, in the many clouds, absolutely no hopers. I, I, I think this is a three horse race on paper, to be honest with you. You've got the uh, Imperial Aura, who uh, has got to kind of prove he can do it now. He's starting to become a little bit of an excuse horse. You know, he's failed to complete on his last three occasions. And of course, he took a took a fall at, at Haydock on his last start. You've got Native River, who's rising 12, who on official ratings is still the one to beat, but he's not going to be getting any better at his age, shall we say. And then you've got Protectorat, who been absolutely crying out for three miles. I mean, this horse under top weight, the Paddy Power Gold Cup, absolutely stormed up the hill, uh, giving lumps of weight away. I think he'll thrive over three miles. And the last time he ran at eight tree, of course, he won a grade one at this track. So I think he's he's the young, he's the unexposed, he's the improver. He's the one I want to be with. So yeah, protector up there. Um, they moved to uh, at Sandown, Ellen Valley on the Saturday in the listed handicap hurdles. Only won once over hurdles. And funny enough, it was uh, over course and distance, but I would want a rain dance. I want the rain to hit the track here. The ground was pretty soft that day uh, when he won, but he's a strong traveller. Would like to be to come with a late rattle, as you would normally associate with uh, Paddy Brennan on board for a uh, for a, a Fergal O'Brien type. He'll be held up racing the ambulance coming to three out and look to kind of weave his way through runners. He's, he's one of those uh, hostage to fortune horses, but I do like course and distance form, especially on soft ground at Sandown. So, yeah, he's one that should go well. Uh, and I don't think he should possibly handicapped either. He was third in the Fred Winter at the Charter Festival off this mark. So he should go well. And then on Sunday, yeah, Alderano Anna, I think it's a huge price. He's going to run in the Peterborough Chase. This race is going to cut up. And Stephen does make a valid point about front runners. This would be an absolute tear up. This horse will come from off the pace. 
Uh, obviously, he won the Holden Gold Cup on his seasonal reappearance, beating Granatine and Hitman. Obviously, those two horses got no chance, uh, I've been told. So they'll be tailed <laughs> off in the Tinkle Creek. And Eldor <laughs> Eldorado Allen are probably got off about 25 to 1 for this. But uh, if either of those two horses show up well, it's Sandown on Saturday. Expect his price to contract. And, but the key with Eldorado Allen here is two keys. The Tis our team are back. They're firing all cylinders. And also the trip. He needed every yard of the extended two miles, one extra last time out. I mean, he just ground it out. Up to two and a half here. He's a big tick in the box. So Joe Tizard said it's basically all roads lead back from the Ryanair chase with him. And uh, yeah, with the yard back amongst the winners, their mojo's back. And I think Al Dorado, well, and this race will cut up to four or five runner affair. He's going to line up. I think he'll probably start about half the price he is. And I think he's a, he's a major player. Lovely stuff. Well, best of luck to you, Ed. And our final, finally, we'll go over to Vincent. You had a profitable week last week, but let's go over some of the results and also your tips for this weekend. Well, I was a bit unlucky last weekend, I have to say. Uh, first of all, Beacon Edge was the winner, um, 5-2. to two. He was actually returned 7-2, to two, so that's why I'm only one point up. Uh, the other thing is my mate Mozzie, four lengths clear between the last two hurdles. How does that horse get beat? I have no idea, but you know, that's racing, as they say. Uh, moving on to this weekend, um, basically, I'm going four-point win on Shaq on Pursois. It should probably be 40-point win, in fairness, just at the price. It, it's the value against the opposition. I'm not saying it's the greatest horse in the world, but he'll beat these, and he'll beat these easy. That's that's my opinion on it. And then the other one is I'm looking at Alaho as the value um, up against Envoy Allen in this Punchestown chase. Look, it's going to be a fantastic spectacle. We, we still don't know the final runners. We're presuming that Alaho, Envoy Allen, Album, Photo, Faku Dadari's run now, I know Stephen was on earlier, was it saying about uh, Fakir Dari's very good horse, or Ed was saying, sorry, when it won in Clonmel the last day. Um, but but you go back to the Ryanair chase in, in Cheltenham last year, which is over this intermediate type distance, and Alaho beats Fakir Dari's 12 lengths, Tornado Flyer back in third. This is a really good horse over this sort of distance. And Alaho, the only question mark is, doesn't tend to be one that wins every year first time out, which is a bit unusual for a horse of this kind of class, but they've messed around the trip a lot over the last few years, finding the right distance for him. And this two and a half mile looks good. Willie Mullins has won the race the last three years. I'd be expecting Alaho to, to at least uh, run well at the price against Envoy Allen, but we, we don't know what we're in for. It could be some spectacle. Great stuff. Well, speaking of a spectacle as well, I can't wait for that Shaq and Pussoir uh, against Noob Negra just to see basically who wins out of Stephen and Vincent. But of course, we will be back next week to kind of review that race as well as give you more tips and advice. So for now, guys, thanks a lot for your excellent analysis and input and best of luck with your tips. But that wraps it up for this week's edition of Jump To It. Of course, if you want all the race cards, all the news and views as well from Vincent and the team, head on over to irishracing.com. Head on over to Betting Expert as well for more views from Stephen Harris every day on all the top UK racing. But for now, thanks a lot for watching. And of course, if you do bet, please gamble responsibly.